Hello, I'm Dr. Tim Sandal and I'm a pharmaceutical microbiologist and I'm pleased to be back with you for the uh, fifth video in this series looking at things related to coronavirus and the COVID-19 disease. And um, in previous videos we've looked at uh, face masks, disinfection, social distancing, lockdown, immunity passports, among other topics. And those videos are available on my YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to look at testing, vaccines, and some other efforts that are in place to help to combat this uh, disease. And as with the previous videos, the, these are short videos. Um, they're only designed to give you some pointers. And as always, I encourage you to read up for yourself um, and, and to take in the information that I'm giving you. OK, so with testing, um, there are three broad areas of testing in relation to this specific coronavirus. The first group of tests are what's called reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction tests as in PCR testing. And here um, samples are collected by uh, swabbing the back of the patient's throat or taking samples from the nose. And there's some evidence indicating that uh, samples from the nose are potentially more uh, accurate, picking up more viral material. And this is using a long, thin swab. Then the virus's ribonucleic acid, RNA, is copied millions to billions of times in order to amplify the signal and so uh, scientists can then detect the virus. And these tests can take typically several hours to complete and there is um, currently a, a global concern about shortages of the necessary reagents in order to perform these tests. The second group of tests are antibody or serology tests. And with this, antibody tests are performed on a sample of a patient's blood. And this is normally obtained through a finger prick. And the blood is then analysed for the presence of antibodies that are produced by the human body in order to fight off the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And while the results can be um, obtained in a matter of minutes, um, there have been a number of concerns expressed about the reliability of these tests. For example, there, there's a whole wave of test kits that have come from China, where the reliability has only been proven to be 30%. So these tests are pretty poor to be in general. But there are some... Uh, more accurate variants that are beginning to emerge. But if you are going to go for these tests, make sure they're coming from a legitimate source. Third are antigen tests. And here a patient, again, it's a sample of like a throat swab, is placed onto a special strip. And there's a colorimetric reaction uh, where there's a color change to indicate if SARS-CoV-2 is indeed present. An antigen is essentially a foreign substance that, that, that's present in the body. And these tests are looking for the uh, corona spike proteins. The, these are the protruding proteins from the surface of the virus, which give the virus its actual name, that, that, that description of the corona shape. And currently these kind of tests are a little bit uh, unreliable and to a degree they're unproven. So they are not currently available to any consumer and are not available to most health services, but maybe in time they present a third alternative. OK, so that's testing. Now, what about vaccines and the like? Well, as part of the major global effort, thousands of researchers around the world at this point in time and clinicians are locked in a race to develop cures, vaccines, as well as better diagnostic tests for COVID-19, which I said earlier is the description, that the term given to the disease that the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 produces. And if you have a quick look on literature, if you, if you go to Google Scholar and the like, 
There's around 1,700 growing uh, articles on COVID-19 um, and these have been added to daily. Furthermore, if you go to the uh, website clinicaltrials.gov, it's a US website, it indicates there are over 400 ongoing clinical trials for, on COVID-19, uh, but the majority of these are still in the earliest of stages. But let's see where we are with some of these. So first with vaccines, the most successful appear to be those that carry uh, something called the receptor binding domain of the coronavirus's S protein. And this um, protein allows the virus to bind and to fuse with host cells. Now, besides the uh, traditional approach to developing vaccines, which use live attenuated uh, or inactivated um, subunit based vaccines, more modern approaches to vaccine development, such as DNA, RNA based and nanoparticle or viral vector being vector borne viruses are also being considered. However, uh, we've got to be um, uh, we have to acknowledge that the race to develop a vaccine takes one to several years. So we need other approaches in the meantime. So the first thing is not to get run away with some of the reports into the media that a vaccine is imminent. It isn't. It's at least 12 months away. In terms of other ways of combating the virus, um, there are approaches that are promising in terms of antivirals. And there's been a lot of discussion lately about one particular antiviral called Remdesivir, um, which has gained uh, early stage approval from the US FDA. So we're kind of interested to see what comes out of that and the trials are based around that. Um, and there's also some developments with gene therapy, which I'll come to in a second. Now, with the um, broad spectrum antivirals, um, you know, the most promising area appears to be with uh, nucleoside analogues. And these are drugs that mimic the bases in the virus's DNA, RNA genome. And they become mistakenly incorporated into nascent RNA chains. So essentially what they're doing is stalling the ability of the coronavirus to replicate, uh, which then obviously stops the spread of disease. And because coronaviruses have what's commonly called a proofreading enzyme, which can um, cut out these kind of mismatches, that's one reason why only certain of these nucleoside analog antivirals are likely to work. So that's again why research is a little bit um, slow going in that area. Um, but this is where remdesivir comes in because it works in a different way and that's why it's seen as a promising candidate. A third area is with convalescent blood plasma and again this has been made a, made a few um, headlines and there's institutions like um, Bioproducts Laboratory that, that, that are working in this field. Um, so this is plasma donated from patients who have recovered from coronavirus. And within a given window of time, the plasma will contain levels of set antibodies which have the potential to work against the virus. An alternative is to go down the monoclonal antibody route. And uh, this relates to um, antibodies that can be isolated and then mass produced through biotechnology. Um, however, again, uh, monoclonal antibodies are another um, product that will take um, a long time to develop. Something else being worked upon are fusion inhibitors. And these are inhibitors of human proteases and um, also being looked at are immune modulators like corticosteroid hormones. Another area which um, is, is worth um, looking into, and if, again worth reading up if you're interested, is with gene um, therapy. And this is an alternative, again, to, to vaccines, or at least until vaccines are available. And this form of gene therapy that's being looked at is through adeno-associated uh, virus. And this could entail a 
relatively fast and targeted delivery of antibodies as well as immune adhesions, antiviral peptides and, as I mentioned earlier, immune modulators into the upper airways. And many scientists think that this at least provides some short-term protection until a virus emerges, as I said, in about a year or perhaps longer time. So um, you can read on this, but um, there is one good publication that, that I've come across, which is published in the journal Frontiers of Microbiology. And if you search for an article called The Current and Future State of Vaccines, Antivirals, Gene Therapies Against Emerging Coronaviruses, then um, that gives a good summation of um, current developments and the literature overall. However, you can get the gist of that. A lot of things are still a little bit further off. So in the meantime, it's still important to follow the recommended countermeasures to control the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a way to address the pandemic. And I've obviously covered a number of these in earlier videos. So observing lockdown, maintaining social distancing when you, when you do go out and practicing regular hand washing soap and water works best hand sanitizers with 60 to 70 percent ethanol or isopropyl alcohol uh, as secondary choices okay well that's it for this video uh it's fifth in the series for other videos looking at covid19 related subjects please check out and ideally subscribe to my YouTube channel. And uh, for this week, um, stay safe. And until next time, I've been Tim Sandal. Goodbye. And again, stay safe.